Okay, hello everyone. Um, thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be in Weimar again. Um, and of course to be um, at the, the world famous IKKM uh, for the first time for me, but unfortunately um, also the last time. Um, so what, what does it mean to speak of media and mathematics? Um, I think we will agree that technology is a medium, but is it not also true that mathematics is a medium? And if so, what kind of medium? Um, and I, I will be speaking about symbols, and I, I think I, I will be um, committing the cardinal uh, um, uh, error of, of coming to Weimar and not talking about hardware, but talking about the symbolic. Um, so uh, I, want, I want to begin by reading a quotation from the mathematician Richard Dedekind um, from his Nachlass in the library at Göttingen. Um, for it was only with Dedekind that mathematics became fully linguistic, fully literate, in fact. We might even say fully digital on November 24th, 1858, when Dedekind closed a door that was first opened by Zeno over 2,000 years prior. And so I'll read a little bit from what you might call Dedekind's uh, ode to arithmetic, his hymn to the digital, his hymn to arithmetic. He said, of all of the aids which the human mind has yet created to simplify its life, that is, to simplify the work in which thinking consists. None is so momentous and so inseparably bound up with the mind's most inward nature as the concept of number. Arithmetic, whose sole object is this concept, is already a science of immeasurable breadth and there can, be, there can be no doubt that there are absolutely no limits to its further development, he said. And the domain of its application is equally immeasurable. For every thinking man, even if he does not clearly realize it, is a man of numbers, a man of arithmetic. So who is this man of arithmetic? What is, this, what is this man obsessed with switches? Let me also read a stanza of a poem uh, by Hans uh, Magnus Enzensberger. Um, you might know uh, his, his book where he uh, created a series of, of poems and, 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 and sort of creative meditations on, on historical figures. And let me read a stanza from a poem dedicated to Leibniz, where here he's sort of pretending that the CIA has, 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 is, has, is investigating Leibniz and has generated a kind of psychological profile of this, uh, this, this strange man of arithmetic, you might say. Our files, says the CIA, yield the following picture. Private life, none. Sexual interests, negative. Emotionally, L is a moron. Leibniz is a moron. His relations to others are as discourse and nothing else. Furthermore, the thing that drives you crazy is that insane diligence. No matter what, anywhere, any time he reads, writes, does arithmetic. The stepped drum rotates, like an automaton, like an automaton that has built an automaton. So what is this man of arithmetic? What is, what is the essence of arithmetic? I think, in fact, the common answer from media theory and media philosophy is to say that 
essence is simply not the right word. That the phenomena of the digital, the phenomena of the analog, these are things that emerge from specific technical conditions. They are effects, not essences. Yet, we might say that this offers a theory that is already biased in favor of the analog. So what would a digital theory of the digital look like? What would a digital theory of switches look like? I think it would favor digital conditions. It would favor things like structure, frame, abstraction, form, language, and yes, mathematics, specifically arithmetic. It would be an issue of both technology and philosophy. And so I want to return to a simple, even we might say kind of naive uh, question, um, the question of the digital and the analog. So the short, um, unfinished novel, Mount Analog, by the French poet René Dumas, presents an intriguing, if also elusive, discussion of the digital and the analog. In contemplating the book, it is hard to know what Dumas meant by the analog mountain, or even by his use of the term analog at all. The novel discusses mountains, mythological accounts of mountains. It, men it mentions scale and differentiates proportion from scale, specifically referring to the scale and inaccessibility of the mountain. It's also not clear if this mountain even exists or where it, where it is. It deals with how mountains act as thresholds between the visible and the invisible. The text laments, quote, an incurable need to understand. Indeed, Domal has some fun around how language relates to knowledge and understanding. For there is a character in the novel named Sogo, which is a reverse spelling of the old Greek word logos, along with a housekeeper who is simply named Physics. And anyone who is curious where Domal might stand today on, on, on this sort of analog digital discussion, um, you can't see it here, but we, we could only, uh, need only consult the novel's vivacious but verbose subtitle, so it's Mount Analog, a tale of non-Euclidean and symbolically authentic mountaineering adventures. Quote, all thought is a capacity to grasp the divisions of a whole, wrote Domal in one of the novel's most elegant moments. The divisions of a whole of absolutely any kind. Toute pensée est une capacité de saisir les divisions d'un tout. Les divisions d'un tout absolument quelconque. What should the reader make of this passage? Is this, like Dedekind or, or Leibniz, a, a hymn to the powers of rational thought? Or is it an admission that whatever the powers of rationality, there will always exist an excess of holes an excess of totalities that, while perhaps graspable, in their very graspability, belie a fundamental separation from thought. So I think, in a certain sense, Domal is returning to some of the original questions of Greek philosophy. What is rationality and what is analogy? What is logos? and what is analogos. Terms like analogy and analog share logos as a common root. Thus, logos and analogos appear at first glance to be connected, 
at least etymologically. But how exactly? Are these two terms opposites? Or do they have a different relation? And if the analog's putative opposite is the digital, where does that put logos? Are digital and logos synonyms? The word logos means speech, discourse, and word, of course. But it also means ratio. And thus, by extension, rationality and reason. The connection between word and ratio might not be entirely clear. It wasn't uh, for me. But consider the art of rhetoric and how a speaker will compose and deliver language. To speak, and to speak well, means to speak in a way that is coherent to speak in a way in which words form proper compositional arrangements. Or consider mathematics. The Pythagoreans, as Friedrich Kittler once wrote, quote, literally referred to the 4-3 ratio of the fourth, the 3-2 ratio of the fifth, and the 2-1 ratio of the octave as logoi. Mathematical ratios like four to three or three to two were understood as logoi because they too, like well-composed speech, were examples of proper compositional arrangements. Arrangements readily audible in music and visible in geometry. And I think that even the notion of the proper is, or the coherent, that's really what's indicted, I think, in this discussion of, of, um, of the digital side. Analogos is something different. The ana in analogos does not negate logos, but in fact produces a different relationship, a kind of, um, I, I, I characterize it more as a parallel relation. Of course, in common sense, ana means up. Uh, it's the opposite of kata, which means down, but that's not the use here. As Pierre Chantren noted in his Dictionary of Greek Etymology, ana can also have a kind of distributive value, meaning at the rate of, by reason of, or in proportion to. And I think this, I think this begins to reveal the true meaning Analogos means literally proportionate with or according to a do logos. Or in abbreviated form, we, we simply just say analogos means proportion. But how did an ancient Greek word meaning proportion eventually become shorthand for modern media technologies like the gramophone? And why use the term analog as a label for philosophers and theorists interested in things like affect, intensity, and becoming? Um, and I mention this just because in the past I've called someone like Gilles Deleuze an analog philosopher. And I think a phrase like analog philosopher uh, is something that makes sense and is definable. So what links all these things together? What links proportion with continuity and continuity with intensity? We already saw uh, Euclid. Um, Euclid, of course, is remembered as a geometer when he is remembered at all. Um, but let's remember that Euclid's Elements was an omnibus compendium of all mathematical knowledge known to him at the time, beginning with the first mathematics, geometry, then addressing ratio and proportion, that is, logos and analogos, and ultimately arithmetic, irrationality, 
and other topics. And he has a technical definition of irrationality. Quote, there is hardly anything in mathematics more beautiful than Euclid's wondrous fifth book, wrote British mathematician Arthur Cayley. Indeed, the definitions that begin uh, book five of the treatise furnish a series of important concepts. First, the mathematical ratio, then proportion, understood as an equality of ratios. So I want to zoom in on this because I think we actually get a very technical definition of both the digital and the analog. Let me focus on definitions three and six. Definition three, a ratio, uh, and, the, and the word is logos, a ratio is a sort of relation in respect of size between two magnitudes of the same kind. And let magnitudes which have the same ratio be called proportional. And proportional here is analogon, um, and ratio is, is logon. So in definition six, there's a shift basically from logon to analogon, and it's a kind of bridge between those two. So I think it's not uh, 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 hyperbole to say that analog and digital appear here on the same page, perhaps for the first time, at least under the guise of logos and analogos. And there's a lot we can say about this, but of immediate interest in definition three, at the top there, um, is the expression um, duo megathon homogenon, two magnitudes of the same kind. Two magnitudes of the same kind. Duo megathon homogenon. So we could even mimic Euclid's terminology even more closely and say two homogenous magnitudes. Homogenous. So what does it take for two magnitudes to be homogenous? To be of the same genus. Um, and this is why I love, you know, people who think mathematics is not political. Uh, this is the kind of stuff I like to quote back to. Homogenous magnitudes. You, you make a homogenous, two homogenous magnitudes, they must contain a part or sub-multiple, the meros out of which each are measured without remainder. So four and three may form the ratio four three because each is measurable by a shared discrete submultiple. It is this simple arithmetical unit, which we call by its more common name one. So both four and three are, are constructed from the monad of, of one and therefore they are homogeneous magnitudes. So some things are comparable, but of course others are not. In English we have the expression, you can't compare apples and oranges. Apples and oranges are not comparable and may form no discrete ratio because they share no submultiple as a common basis for measurement. And this is one indication for why aesthetics and digitality belong to fundamentally different paradigms. Perception, of course, easily accommodates qualitative difference, while digitality constitutionally prohibits it. The logos ratio is thus a very strange beast, both multiple, we can make integers, and homogenous. The digital begins with a cut, a differential cut, the cut of distinction, and there's a lot more we can say about that, but I, I will refer, refer to it as a cut. But beyond the initial cut, all future differentiation is based on the same genus, the homogenous. Later in the treatise, Euclid expands 
expands this basic insight by stipulating that logos ratios are symmetric, which is literally with measure or commensurable. And again, it's that same idea of being measured through a shared common part. And so there's a distinction made between the, 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 the symmetric and the asymmetric. And the irrational is the asymmetric. Definition six shifts the discussion slightly. While the previous definition concerned a single ratio, itself defined as a relation of two discrete numbers, this definition duplicates the ratio, bringing two ratios into a relation of equality. So if you have two ratios that are the same, four to three or eight to six, they are analogous or proportional. Okay, so this may not seem so, so, so strange, but I think um, we, we, can, we can generalize from these very particular definitions. And so I wanna propose that we can actually, from these definitions, we can move to um, general formula for both logos and analogos. And so the insinuation here is that this is a gen these are general formula for digital and analog. Again, there are a lot of other ways to define digital analog, but my kind of perverse uh, you know, hypothesis is that, is that we still yet don't have a digital theory of the digital. So the general formula for logos is, therefore, A to B, or A over B. So this is the ratio, the ratio between two homogeneous elements. So typically these will be integers. Um, Whereas the general formula for analogos is the reduplication of the ratio. A over B equals C over D. Um, and this definition is actually in Euclid, so this is, a, this is a very old definition. The equation of two existing ratios. These two expressions are revealing. At the outset, they confirm that analogos is in fact not the negation or inversion of logos. And thus, by extrapolation, the analog is not the opposite of the digital. And it's easy, and I even do this a lot, is to, is to fall into this trap of kind of this, this binary opposition, but I don't think that's technically true. In, 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 in point of fact, the two, um, you know, analogous is maybe something like a twin or an echo or, or again, some kind of paralleling. Yet even as the former is shown to be a reduplication of the latter, the two terms diverge dramatically in their connotations and effects. The two expressions may look similar and they may be composed, the one out of the other, but they ultimately produce two very different technologies. So we would have to go further into Euclid to demonstrate it, but at root, the digital, or logos, and I admit that it's maybe not perfect to fuse those two terms, but um, the digital relies on, as I said, a homogeneous substrate of elements that are differentiated quantitatively. And this is what we call arithmetic. This is the arithmetical um, core. Um, those famous zeros and ones get the most attention, but the rest of the integers are just as digital as are the natural numbers overall and the rational number line as a whole are all equally digital. And the discussion need not be limited to number since the alphabet is an advanced digital technology too, as influential as the integers, if not more so. And of course, in languages like Hebrew or Greek, letters of the, alphabet, uh, of the alphabet are just deployed as counting numbers. So any other system of, of mediation constructed from quantitative difference in this way, I think, will likewise earn the moniker digital. Like its digital twin, the analog may also be generalized into a series of movements or mechanisms. 
So first, the analog relies on a substrate where all elements are strictly heterogeneous to each other, which is to say they relate primarily via non-quantitative difference without recourse to an abstract or symbolic infrastructure. And all that ultimately matters is that the two ratios are similar. So it's, it's almost like the equal sign um, it has, has, a, has a, a like inflated sense of, 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 uh, of power. Um, that's where the magic is. Thus, there is technically no such thing as an analog alphabet or an analog language, or if such a language exists, it would be, as Deleuze wrote, a strictly aesthetic language of, quote, expressive movements, paralinguistic signs, breaths, and screams. And I think this is the kind of analog code that, that Wolfgang was getting at. The digital logos is formed from a relation between standardized elements, but the analog pertains to an equality of things that remain particular in their own rationality. So in a sense, the digital is internally same, while the analog is externally same. Or at least that's how I try to kind of formulate where the stress falls for each term. This produces a somewhat counterintuitive scenario in which the general formula for the digital, A, A over B or A to B, there's no equal sign there. It expresses no explicit equality of terms, yet it contains an implicit equality of type. This is the homogeneous again. So there's, there's a kind of, uh, infor it enforces equality of type, but, but it does not enforce uh, uh, visible equality between the terms, the values of the terms. Yet the general formula for the analog, A over B equals C over D, appears to flaunt a pair of ratios, but the ultimate effect, I think, is to kind of obliterate the particular forms of rationality in favor of a single generic equality. It's almost like A over B equals C over D. Each one of those ratios is, is almost black boxed into a separate entity, and it's just the, the, the relation between the two. So both terms, I think, are rooted in, in paradox. The digital is internally homogeneous, and yet somehow always two. The digital is always stressing the, the two. And the analog is internally heterogeneous while still remaining one. And I think this is why Deleuze, whose work we must admit is an extended love song to heterogeneity and analogicity, could also sing in praise of univocity or speaking in one voice, right? How can this philosopher be interested in multiplicity and difference and also be interested in the one? It's, it's very strange. So as you can see, I'm trying to think about the digital and the analog really as general modes of mediation, not facts about hardware, or at least not only facts, and obviously we need to do both of those things. And I think a whole new landscape becomes visible if we look at it from, from this perspective. What are the greatest digital technologies? The logic gate and the computer are merely the latest in a long stream of digital technologies that would begin with the letters, the alphabet, the integers, or depending who you ask, the atom, the synapse, the gene, and even the point itself in what, uh, as we saw already on, on Wolfgang's slide, in what Euclid called uh, the semion or mark, right? It's not the, it's not the, the stigma, it's the, it's the, it's the mark, which is, which is very important. Um, he's, he's giving us a license to do a media theory, in fact. Surely these are the great technologies of the digital. 
and the second uh, the second uh, line uh, refers to the grame, right? So it is it is a media. Uh, it is it's furnishing itself to media analysis from the very beginning. At the same time, to think beyond hardware and consumer electronics solely, although I'm very interested in those things too, sort of liberates the analog side as well. The analog is now not simply the vinyl record or magnetic tape, but intensity, duration, sensation, affect, as well, of course, as the wave, the gradient, the curve. These are the kind of more paradigmatic technologies of the analog. The analog exists wherever there is similarity between qualitative particulars in the absence of quantified atoms. And so I think we can say the analog is quite simply the interface of real difference. And this is difficult whenever you use a word like the real. Um, but I think from the perspective of the analog, this is a real that has been um, denuded of its romantic and nostalgic aura, if that's even possible. A real that is not locked into a logic of presence or absence, the real without the principle of norm and deviation. Here, the real is understood as full and continuous, where representation, if representation is still a relevant uh, word for analog phenomena, where representation is fully coextensive with reality. And by that I just mean there's no metaphysical kind of logic of like the, 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 the real and the irreal, or the real and the false. There's no sampling, there's no capture. Um, the analog is the real with no abstraction in, in that sense. So this is not to deny that it's a mode of mediation, it's simply to claim that the analog is a mode of mediation that remains within the real rather than um, appealing to some form of symbol. So again, I'm trying to think about what, what would analog thought be? What would digital thought be? Um, and, and, I, and I've noticed that analog thinkers tend to favor things like empiricism and pragmatism over things like structuralism or rationalism. So you might say that it's, that it's a bit more uh, British than it is French. Empiricism and pragmatism are fundamentally analogical in nature. They tend to be skeptical toward generalizable digital structures, such as name, word, law, technique, category, or kind. Both empiricism and pragmatism are in this way nominalist at heart, which is, which is to say they, and it's, nominalist is a strange word, right? Like, is it about the name or is it a rejection of the name? And it, it, I think of it as sort of in name only, right? Because nom the nominalist position is one that does reject the proper name or law. On the other hand, digitality is nothing more than a generalized theory of names, generalized theory of naming. This is also why the analog favors aesthetics over other things, reason, judgment. Why its adherents favor deterritorialization over territorialization why they tend to think in terms of assemblage, multiplicity, difference, heterogeneity. These are all conditions in which the identity of qualitative difference takes precedence over the regular structure of letter, number, or symbol. The, the, the switching process begins to break down. Quote, in the beginning is chaos, wrote Elizabeth Gross, a prominent Delizian, in her Wellick lectures from 2007. Continuing the quote, 
the whirling, unpredictable movement of forces, vibratory oscillations that constitute the universe. So think of it, a digital philosopher would be very worried by most of the terms in that quotation. Chaos, forces, oscillations, and that it helps me kind of understand that the difference between these, these paradigms. So the colloquial sense of analog as the offline, the old, uh, the, the real, um, the obsolete, <laughs> the authentic, um, the richly aesthetic, that the colloquial sense I, I don't think is incorrect, even if terms like that um, are ideologically distracting. The point is not so much that analogicity is more authentic, but that it favors synthesis and synthetic qualities over analysis and analytical atoms. Unencumbered by the proper name or rule, the analog is most readily found in those methods and fields that operate largely in the absence of discrete ratio chief among them uh, empiricism and pragmatism, as I suggested, but also um, aesthetics and ethics, I would argue. Unencumbered by discrete atoms, the analog is found most readily in technologies of curves and waves, in an aesthetic of smoothness and unbroken lines, planes, or volumes. The mirror, the echo, the ghost, the trace, the outline, these are paradigmatic analog modes. Its materiality is water, liquidity, flow, or perhaps plastic with its molding and continuous variation. And I'm thinking of the work of people like uh, Heather Davis or um, Catherine Malibu. Plastic, but also metal with metallurgical annealing as a kind of um, liquefaction of matter happening analogically. But water, metal, and plastic are mere metonymy for analog materiality overall, which melts and morphs into swirling shards of chaos, as Elizabeth Gross put it. So just to kind of co coalesce some of these, these, these comments here, um, I think that we can, uh, again, working more in a more kind of, I don't know, structural or, 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 or kind of philosophical language, I think we can actually identify a mode called analog philosophy and also digital philosophy. So first and foremost, the analog philosopher, and I'll just kind of rush through these characterizations, these are very general, but to kind of synthesize what I just said, the analog philosopher will focus on things like assemblage, multiplicity, heterogeneity, and difference. Analog ontology will favor deterritorialization over territorialization, becoming over being, process over stasis, the open over the closed. This generates an analog ethics that is focused on doing, action, production, creativity, experimentation, pragmatism. And also I think a, a kind of aesthetics of aesthetics maybe, uh, an aesthetics of chance, accident, and chaos. And a lot of the aesthetic qualities um, revolve around phenomena like chaos, accident, chance, contingency. Likewise, we can also spot a digital philosopher if we look um, the digital philosopher will favor structures generated through difference. These structures of difference include binary opposition, hierarchy, norms, but of course also um, rupture, distinction, cutting. The digital philosopher will favor analysis over synthesis. He will want to break things down into their constituent parts. And his preferred mo mode of analysis is to encounter a complex world and to divide it into 
just two categories. The digital philosopher will favor abstraction, structure, language, logic, rationality, and form. He will be a structuralist, a rationalist, a formalist, a critic, a mathematician, an idealist, a metaphysician. So just, just to end, um, let, me, let me just um, just add a couple very short, uh, uh, I don't know, sort of, uh, let, me, let me admit a, a, a few things to kind of transition into discussion. Um, of course, this is a false distinction. And I think that's on purpose because the digital is always in some sense false. And so to present, to present it in this form, I think, is a way to encounter the false, but not to disavow the false. And I'm diminishing the fact that the digital and the analog are intimately intertwined, which I would um, certainly admit. And to separate them like this is, is a kind of, um, I don't know, uh, heuristic convenience, but they are intimately intertwined because we know that all digital phenomena will produce analog effects, and all analog phenomena also will tend to digitize. And, and once you think you've found the most paradigmatic, you know, uh, analog phenomena or the most paradigmatic digital phenomena, you will immediately see artifacts from the other domain, right? You see a waveform, ah, there's a peak and a valley and so it starts to regularize. Nevertheless, we have, since Euclid, up through Leibniz, Dedekind, and to the present day, I think, perhaps, a strictly digital theory of the digital and the analog. So in, in anticipation of your questions, I will stop there. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>